أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Tonight actually the night uh, we should and I should congratulate everyone, all Mu'mini and Mu'minat, uh, for the birth of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alihi Wasallam and his grandson Al Imam Abi Abdullah Jafar ibn Muhammad al Sadiq Alaihi wa Alaihim Alaf al Tahiyyati wa Salam. And uh, we have a narration. It's very recommended to fast tomorrow. It's one of four days that is, hadith says that any Shia should fast unless he has an excuse. So the first one starts with the birth of our Prophet wasallam, the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal which the narration states that whoever fasts that day, he will get the thawab of 60 years of uh, fasting. I mean, uh, so 60 years, if you live 100 years, you're not going to even be able to fast all these times. Anyway, so that's just for one day. The second day is uh, yawm, uh, the, the mab'ath, and uh, the third day is Dahwil Ard, which is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expanded the land beneath Kaaba and created this earth. And the fourth day is uh, Ghadir Khum, which if you uh, notice that all are connected, the Mab'ath, the birth, the Mab'ath, and the uh, expansion of the Kaaba, uh, and that's the Khalifa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose and the uh, uh, Ikmal al-Din which is with Khadir Khum. I always said that that just two days throughout the whole year is not enough to know someone yet alone to know a great person, someone like the Prophet ﷺ. You have to read a book, you have to educate yourself regarding the Prophet ﷺ. And there's books and articles that have been wrote about the Prophet that can fill a really massive library. So, inshallah, I'm excited to uh, start, especially with this blessed night, the night of the uh, Mawlid of Rasulullah, the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, inshallah, with a series to talk about Ahl Bayt sallallahu wa sallam wa alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah is the descendant of Ismail the son of Ibrahim alayhima afdal salati wassalam. But we will talk about the people who involved with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. Of course, his uh, lineage they were all the great people of Quraysh. And I'm talking the great leaders of Quraysh, actually. Uh, starting with Qusay ibn Kilab, and uh, then Abdul Manaf al mughayra His name was Abdul Manaf, but his actual name was al mughayra And the third one is Hashim, which from him you can say that Hashim and uh, Hashim had a brother called Abd Shams. Abd Shams had a, 
son who was named Umayyah. Umayyah was very jealous of Hashem. Hashem, the lineage of the Prophet, the grandfather of the Prophet, let's say, the great grandfather of the Prophet, was uh, uh, taking care of the Hujjaj who came to the pilgrims to the Kaaba. He was very pious. But this person was always uh, conspire against his uncle. So they went to someone and uh, as a judge, even though, subhanAllah, even though Hashim was the leader, Hashim was very respected, he could have said anything. But they went to a judge and the judge decided to uh, banish Umayyah. And Umayyah went to north, which is Syria today. So that's why you see Umayyah bin Umayyah, they chosen that land because they had connection with that land to rule. Anyway, Arabia, especially the, the desert part of Arabia, the Arabic uh, Peninsula, Arabian Peninsula, it wasn't all uh, like uh, tribes and uh, like heathens on, or savages. Part of it was under the control of uh, Roman Empire, the northern part. So you see, some of the Arabs, yeah, when they went to trade there, they knew their, their, they had like connections. So they were Arabs, like for example, in a lot of countries, there is a specific ethnicity who live and people uh, have relatives overseas, right? So when they, those people come, the people they deal with and the people they know is the people who reside there. So they had some people and Arab tribes who live under the uh, Roman Empire. And to the east, another Arab of Hira, they called them. There were a few tribes of Arab who lived uh, under the Persian Empire. But to the south, those two, two tribes of, or two Arabs uh, people who lived under those two uh, empires uh, were not very significant or important. But to the south, there was civilization actually. They had a king, they had a kingdom who was conquered uh, later on by the Persian as well. And there were Christians, like Najran. So one of the people of those uh, uh, kings, one of the most important, let's say, king of, those, uh, of this civilization was a man called Abraha and Habashi, right? So Abraha actually name is uh, Abrazim and his like Abraha Abrahim. So he built a really massive church in Sana'a, which is until today is the capital of Yemen. So he built there. And uh, in my opinion, that he wanted not just the people of Najrana or Christians to come there, but for the Arab tribes as well to come there instead of going to Mecca. Because apparently even people within his uh, kingdom were used to go to Mecca to uh, attend uh, the pilgrimage and to go there. So this person, he was upset and he, said, uh, he sent an ambassador. Uh, for some reason, someone killed that ambassador. So they gave an Abraham an excuse to go there and uh, to uh, uh, try and destroy the Kaaba. So Abraham, he took elephants with him, which was something that the Arab in that area couldn't fight. They were very strong, but like you take a gun to a knife fight, you cannot handle that, you cannot protect yourself from it. So they took elephants. Some people had some doubts, cast their some uh, doubt that, you know, how can an elephant travel 1,000 kilometers from the south there in a desert? First of all, 
it wasn't all desert. They say like elephant needs uh, a lot of water, right? It wasn't all desert. And plus, the elephant has a, a very strong st uh, uh, stamina. He can handle. Like in, in Africa, if you see documentaries, they travel hundreds of miles, right, to find water. Anyway, so they came, and by then, the leader of Quraysh was Abdul Muttalib, which his actual name was Shaybah. Shaybah was the actual name of Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Rasulullah sallallahu so he was named Abdul Muttalib because his uncle Muttalib he took care of him and you know still to this day some people like uh, uh, are saying it's a shirk to say uh, for example, Abdul Zahra, Abdul Rasul, Abdul Hussein, all that they say it's shirk because it's uh, the Ubudiya should be just for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this doesn't mean to be that it's like a person who was raised or was protected or was, or was influenced by a person you say he is Abd because he gonna be considered as his master. For example, if someone, they say, uh, there's a narration, man allamani harfan sayyarani abdan, whoever teach me something, teach me a word, I become his servant, his slave, right? So it's a metaphor, it's not actual, anyway. So because he was raised by Shayba, it was by Muttalib, he was called Abdul, Muttalib, his actual name Shayba, and they called him Shayba Tul Khair. He was one of the most honorable people of the Quraysh tribe. All respected him, all feared him. So when Abraha came with his army, uh, he took, he confiscated, as uh, people know and been there or actually uh, saw something, I mean, saw. Actual uh, Mecca is in the valleys. Nothing grows there. It's all rocks. So the people who had like uh, camels or sheep, they needed to take their animals outside so they can eat and they can uh, grow. So when they came, they took Abdul Muttalib camels. With back then the if you take someone's camel, you take everything from him, right? It's their livelihood. They drink from it, they eat, they eat it, they ride it, everything. Okay, they trade on it, everything. So he took them all. Abdul Muttalib went. Abraha uh, went to Abraha. Abraha, he very, at first glance, he respected Abdul Muttalib. Why? Because Abdul Muttalib. Uh, his physique was very beautiful. He was a very beautiful man and uh, looks like a very holy man as well. And in fact, he was. He was a Muahad. He wasn't a heathen. He wasn't a pagan. So then uh, he told that I want my camels. He said, I came and you the head of Mecca, of this tribe. I came to destroy the house that you worship. And you came and asked me for, my, for your camel? He says, I am the Lord of the camels. And the Kaaba has a Lord that will protect it. And that what happened. So he went, he left. The people of Quraysh, they were uh, on, on the mountains escaping, of course, the camel. I mean, so uh, uh, the camels, of course, uh, and the elephant cannot uh, go on the mountains. So they were on the mountains watching what's happening. From the seaside, they saw that when they decided to go to uh, attack and destroy the Kaaba, they saw that uh, Ababil, this small birds, came and with uh, three stones, two in, uh, in, uh, on their feet uh, holding and one in their peak. So they started 
to uh, uh, attack the Abraha's army. So they started f fleeing, uh, they fled and they start uh, uh, dying. Even Abraha, you know, they found uh, an, uh, a stone. Been, uh, you see like some, some of the stones that have been carved on or like been uh, uh, painted on from that era that depicts and shows that incident. Anyway, in Najran. Abraha went and uh, they said that the way he died was very gruesome, that uh, his limbs start falling one by one, like his fingers start falling, like uh, there is actually some kind of disease that this might happen, this can happen. So Abdul Muttalib, and but this what did to the Quraysh, you know, we have a narration that states, Quraysh that says that uh, a sin it might, uh, that sometimes it's better for you than a good deed. Why? Because some of it has an opposite effect. You might, sometimes you sin and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. You start weeping, you start crying. You start asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. But sometimes you do something good. I think that's it. Allah loves me now, right? He favors me. So Quraysh, when they saw this, they said that God's, they were pagans, pagans, favors us. They favor us. They felt the self-importance and the news spread in the Arabic Peninsula. So Quraysh start saying, we are better than everyone. And they start uh, putting these restrictions on the pilgrims. A pilgrim cannot bring any food or any drink in Mecca. He needs to buy it from them. He cannot bring even his clothing. He needs to buy it from them or do tawaf naked, even for, for the women. Anyway, so they started drinking more, gambling more, start doing all the sins in the book. The Arabs originally had good um, qualities as well, like uh, generosity, like courage, eloquent. They were very eloquent. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose that language to be the language of heaven and Quran. Anyway, Abd al-Muttalib had a lot of sons. His last one was called Abdullah. Abdullah, once he told his father that when I go outside of Mecca, I see a light coming out of my back, splits open to two. One goes to the east and one goes to the west. And then it comes back and goes to the cloud and then it comes back to my back as well. And when I sit on somewhere dry and bare, it will grow. And the ground beneath me it says salam to be for the bearer of Muhammad Rasulullah. So, Abdul Muttalib chose a wife, his uh, Amina bint Wahab bint Abd Manaf like second cousin, let's say, to be his wife. Abdullah used to trade. He went to the north, and uh, I think it was Abdul Manaf that uh, did this tradition, that in the uh, summertime, they go to the north, and in the winter time, for four months, they go to the south. So he went to trade, and uh, while in his way back at the city of Yathrib, later on to be called Al-Madinah Al-Munawwara, 
his wife relative, Bani Najjar they called, Amr ibn Bani Najjar, they lived there in Yathrib. But Yathrib as a city, uh, it was a diseased city. Like they even back then they, they had this name for a specific disease that called Yathrib uh, fever. It was a very filthy city. Uh, and uh, it was a disease. Like the people there, they had immunity apparently. But the visitors used to get sick and die. So he, he got sick there, he stayed there, and he died at that city. And he was buried in one of the, uh, the Banu Najjar's houses. So there are some claims that Rasulullah was born, like a few months later, Abdullah died. Some claim no, before he was born. But the day that Rasulullah was born, it was at the dawn. And something happened in the world. Interestingly, like the majority of those things happened in Persia. Because they, were, uh, they weren't uh, uh, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like for the Christians, they had a book, right? But those people worshipped the fire. So the first thing was their fire, which was ignited for hundreds of years, was extinguished. They didn't know what happened. Then... Taq Kisra, the palace of Kisra. At that day, cracked. And 14, 14, one, four, 14 of his balcony fell. And uh, a lake called Lake Sawa in the uh, province of Iraq, Sumawa, was dried out. And all that because back then uh, the Persian Empire used to rule Iraq day nowadays and a light came that everyone saw at that day and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi was, wa sallam was born sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it used to be a mosque next to the Masjid al-Haram the house what was, that was Rasulullah was born in. Those guys destroyed it. Then become, became, uh, uh, I think, a library for a while. Then uh, they destroyed it. And a mosque for a while. Anyway. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was, uh, after three days, Amman couldn't breastfeed him anymore. She gave him to a lady called Thuwaybah. She was a servant, which uh, accidentally, she, uh, because the day that uh, Abdul Muttalib, Mar uh, Abdul Muttalib, he uh, brought a wife for his son Abdullah, he married her cousin as well called she was called Dalala so from Dalala Abdul Muttalib had a son who was named Hamza Ibn Abdul Muttalib so Hamza and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam were about the same age and they breastfed from the same lady that one day that asked, they told Rasulullah, why don't you marry uh, Abdul uh, uh, Hamza's daughter? And he said, I can't, he's my brother. He was very close to Hamza, Sayyidu Shuhada Rabbanullah Ta'ala Ali. Asadullah wa Asadu Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Alaihi Muhammad for the honor of Hamza. Rasulullah loved Hamza a lot. That even one day a person came to him and told him that, name my son, choose a name for my son. He says, 
name the dearest son, the dearest names to me. He says, what? He says, Hamza. So Rasulullah when he was four months old, he was given to Halima Sa'diyya. And she went, uh, and she took him for five years. And during this five years, Amin ibn Wahab saw him just three, uh, three times. When he was five, she took him, the first thing that she wanted to do, to visit the grave of her husband, the father of Rasulullah. And they went there, stayed there for a while. On their way back in the village called Al Abwa, it's 200 kilometers north of Mecca and 170 kilometers south of Medina. Uh, Amina, after getting sick, she passed away there, and her grave is still at that village. And uh, that village, inshallah, later on we'll talk about. Uh, Allah, some, uh, uh, some incident happened in that village. One is uh, Rasulullah first Ghazwa, uh, that uh, first um, uh, he was going after Quraysh, was at that city called Ghazwat al Abwa. But it didn't take place, the war didn't take place, and he, uh, the people of Abwa pledged their allegiance to Rasulullah. And Imam al kazim Salamullah Alayhi was born in that village Abwa. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was without a father and without a mother. So Abdul Buttalib, he took a, a special care and special attention he gave to his grandson Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And after Rasulullah was about eight years old, his grandfather Abdul Muttalib Shaybatul Khair, he passed away and he was under the protection of Abu Talib bin Salamullahi alayhi. Inshallah, we will bless this majlis with uh, two hadith from Rasulullah and from his grandson, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi wa jma'in. Husnul khulq an al Rasul, salallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa salam, husnul khulq nasf al deen, a good manners, a good akhlaq, is half of your religion. And we have a narration that Whoever marries, he will proclaim the other half. So those two things, having a good akhlaq and having the protection of a lady, of a good lady. Al-Imam al-Sadiqan alayhi salam, husnul khunqi min ad-deen wa huwa yazidu fa rizq If you have a good manners, it's a part of religion, it is part of religion, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase your rizq your wealth, it's, subhanAllah, if there's two people, one has a good man, has good akhlaq, and they sell the same thing, and the other one has bad akhlaq, and maybe sells cheaper, you will rather to go and pay premium and top dollar to the one with good akhlaq, and leave the one with the bad akhlaq. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, uh, Bring us closer to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and his progeny. Inshallah, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will make us see the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, al-Mahdi. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, glorify uh, mu'mineen and mu'minat with the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam at their deathbed and in, the, uh, in, the, in their grave and in the Yawm Al-Qiyamah and to be next to him in the uh, heaven, insha'Allah. Inna wa liya tawfiq wa sallahum ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala tayyibina al-tahirin.